Growth of the May June 2019 economics paper one. So which, are the, which one of the following is a factor of production? When we talk about factors of production, we're talking about resources that help in the production of goods and services. So we have, so we have uh, economics, paper one. The first question, 1A. Which, are, which one of the following is a factor of production? When we talk about factor of production, we're talking about resources that help in the production of goods and services. We have land, we have profit, wages, and manufacturing. The only factor of production here is land. Because factors of production are land, labor, capital, and enterprise. So the answer is A. No. Clear. Question two. The firm has a total fixed cost of $40,000 per month and variable cost of $150 per unit. If it produces 1,000 units, what are the total costs per month? Total cost is fixed cost plus variable cost. Here, our variable cost will be the, co uh, the variable cost per unit multiplied by the output. So it is 150 multiplied by 1,000. That gives us $150,000. So $150,000, which is our variable cost, plus $40,000, which is our fixed cost, makes our total cost, which is $190,000. So the answer is A. Clear? Yes. Question C. What is meant by the term demand? Demand is the quantity of goods consumers are willing and able to buy at a given price on time. That is what demand is. Clear? Yes. So we go to question D. Say the formula for social cost. Social cost is external cost plus private cost. External cost plus private cost. That is social cost. Question E, are you there? Yes. Divide the term tertiary sector. For the tertiary sector, these are the sector that this is the sector that provides services, like uh, services in the economy, like teaching, banking, insurance, tourism, tourism. These are tertiary sector. Any question about that? Any question, please? No. So we'll move on to question E. Uh, question F. It said, calculate the average cost per unit for the firm. When it makes 2,000 units, you are advised to show your working. It said we should calculate the average cost. Average cost is total cost divided by output. Total cost divided by output. Here we have our quantity to be 2,000. Yes. We have our fixed cost to be 7,340. Then our variable cost is 4,760. Before we get our total cost, uh, we can't get our average cost without finding the total cost. Total cost is total fixed cost plus total variable cost. So that gives us... So here our total cost is total fixed cost plus total variable cost, which gives us 12,100. Then you divide it by output, which is 2,000. So our average cost is total fixed cost, total cost divided by output, which is 6.05. So it is 6.05. I think it's clear. Is it clear, please? Yes. Then we'll go to question G. It said, using the di diagram, Using the diagram below, draw the effect on the market for crops. After a hurricane destroys farmland, maybe the new curve, new equilibrium price, and new equilibrium quantity. We talk about equilibrium. Equilibrium is the price of equilibrium price is the price of agreement between quantity demanded and quantity supply. Equilibrium quantity is the quantity of agreement between demand and supply. Then we have so when there's a hurricane, hurricane is seen as a, a natural disaster, and if there's a natural disaster, it means it will, the supply curve, the, the, uh, the supply of the supply of crops would reduce, making shifting the, uh, the supply curve, the supply of crops will reduce. So that means the quantity supplied in the market will reduce from QE to Q1, the leftward. Then the quantity supplied, the supply curve will shift leftward from S to S1. So, and the price will, as a result of that, the price will increase from P E to P1. So this is what happens. Hurricane is seen as a natural disaster. The point, the point of equilibrium is P E Q E. P E Q E. This is where demand and supply meet. But with equilibrium, and this is demand and this is supply. At equilibrium, based on hurricane, which is a natural disaster, it will reduce the quantity demand, the quantity supplied in the market of crops, shifting it left off. So the quantity, uh, the quantity supplied of crops will reduce from Q E to Q1. That will contract. As a result of that, the supply curve will shift leftward from S to S1. Begin about contraction in the uh, in, we about contraction in the demand curve. Bring it about an increase in supply in price from PE to P1. So supply would reduce because the quantity supplied in the market will reduce. The supply curve will shift leftward and the price will increase from PE to P1. That is the situation about the graph. So we we'll go to question H. Are you there? Yes. 
have that. They said, uh, concert, concert tickets to see the most popular music artists can sell, sell for very high prices. There's no one reason why the demand for these tickets, tickets might be priced inelastic. It is priced inelastic if the quantity demanded, if the quantity demanded does not change. Does not, there's no significant change in the quantity demanded as a result of a change in price. So if there's no change in the quantity demanded as a result of a change in price, it is called price inelastic. So the demand for mu musical concerts may be priced inelastic based on the following reasons. One, one reason for a product to be priced inelastic would be as a result of lack of substitute. So the musical concert, does not, if it doesn't have a substitute, it means you, can't, you don't have any other choice than to watch the musical concert. As a result of that, the, the, price, uh, the demand for it will be priced inelastic. Okay. So I wrote here, one reason for a product to be priced inelastic would be as a result of lack of substitute. This means if they want to watch the artist performing live, they have no choice. Because it's an artist that wants to perform live. So that is the opportunity you have, you have to, watch, to watch the art, artist perform live. Yes. So, and you just have to watch it. So the demand for, for watching it will be priced inelastic. Yes, Is it clear? Yes, Any question about that? So now, no. So we we'll go to H. Hold on, please. Question high. Introduced in 1935, Inca Cola is a yellow gold colored fixed soft drink that is popular mm -hmm. all over Peru. In, by 18, 1995, Inca Cola had grown to become a stronger competitor of Coca-Cola. Inca-Cola had a 32.9% market share compared to Coca-Cola 32.0 in Peru. By 2014, Coca-Cola owned 48.5% of Inca-Cola shares. With reference to the data above and your knowledge of economics, analyze the possible reasons for Coca-Cola purchasing shares in Inca-Cola. Coca-Cola might purchase Inca-Cola due to the following reasons. One, Inca-Cola is a major competitor of Coca-Cola and the price leader. Based on the case study, Inca-Cola has more shares and is the price maker. Is the price leader yes. in, in the industry in Peru. Yes. So what, this is one of the reasons why Coca-Cola might want to buy Inca-Cola. Two, Coca-Cola is behind Inca-Cola in terms of market share. So Coca-Cola has 32.0 market share, and Inca-Cola has 32.5. So it is interest. It will be interesting for. It is. At, it will be attractive to invest in Inca-Cola. So. That means Coca-Cola would be having Inca-Cola as part of its own company mm -hmm. instead of being a competitor. So it is, it is preferable yes. to have Inca-Cola as, as part of the owner of Inca-Cola than Inca-Cola becoming a competitor yes, to yes. Coca-Cola. The third one, buying the shares will increase the benefits of Coca-Cola rather than struggle. So if Coca-Cola buys Inca-Cola, it means it is more beneficial because Inca-Cola is also doing well in the market. So it's more beneficial than struggle. Okay. For Inca Cola, for Coca Cola, is it clear? Yes. Go to question two. Yes. Are you there? Two. They said, which one of the following is part of is part of the economic problem of scarcity? The economic problem of scarcity is what to produce, how to produce, for whom to produce. To. Yes. So the only one that is here is what to produce, which is B. Is it clear? Yes. What to produce? And we we have been talking yet. How to produce, when to produce, what from to produce, what to for whom to, to produce. produce too. So we go to question. They said, a country is able to produce agricultural and non-agricultural goods. Its production possibility curve is shown in figure three. This is the production possibility curve. Now the question says, which one of the following points is not achievable? Point W is achievable. It only means that more of agricultural goods are produced and less of few of non-agricultural goods are produced. Point Z is achievable because it means non-agricultural goods are produced without any agricultural goods. Point X means that the resources are not fully utilized but it's still achievable. Point Y is not achievable because there's no resources to reach point Y. So it, the answer is Z. Point Y is not achievable. Oh, uh, why? Okay. Question C. Question C. Okay, C. They said, calculate the price elasticity of demand for, of a product, for a product when price increases by 15% and quantity demanded falls by 12%. You advise to share your working. For price elasticity of demand, it is the degree of responsiveness between the quantity demanded of a product as a result of the change in price. So, 
So here we have, they said oh, we should P D is persistent change in quantity demanded over persistent change in price. So here we have an increase in price. The, an increase in price is 15%, and quantity demand fell by 12%. So there's a positive, so persistent change in quantity demanded over persistent change in price. We're going to have an increase in price by 15% divided by, so minus 12%, quantity fell by 12%, so minus 12% divided by 15, that gives us a negative of 0 0.8. Do you understand? So that's about that. So PED is percentage change in quantity demanded over percentage change in price. Mm -hmm. So go to question D. Divide the term innovation. When we talk about innovation, innovation is an idea that leads to a new process or a new product. An idea that leads to a new product or process is called innovation. Is it clear? Innovation, yeah. Any question about that? No. So go to question E. State one factor that will cause a demand curve to shift to the left. One factor that will cause demand curve to shift to the left is a le uh, level of income. If the income level falls, the demand for goods will reduce. Mm -hmm. Because the demand for goods will reduce. As a result of that, the demand curve will shift to the left side. Is it clear? Is it clear or not? Yes. Level of income. So question F, are you there? Yep, income. It said, between congestion in Dakar, nearly 70 million people live in Dakar, the capital of Bangladesh. Where? Question F, right? Bangladesh, Dakar. Yes. Okay. Are you there? Yes. So the story is that it said, Dakar has a large number of auto rickshaws competing for ferries. Apart from price, describe one advantage for passengers of this competition. Aside price. I wrote, as large numbers of vehicles are competing, it brings more about choice for consumers. So one advantage about competition. Competition means the rivalry that exists between firms that are trying to sell to the same customers. Mm -hmm. So if there's competition in the market, it increases the choice customers will make. So they have different choices to make. From, to make. But if there is no competition, that means whatever they have, is whatever they, it's available is what they buy. So competition allows customers to, buy, to choose from different varieties. Do you understand what competition yeah. does? Uh, that's the advantage. Any question about that? No. Question G. Which With reference to the information given in beating the congestion in Dakar, explain one reason why prices for journeys using an auto rickshaw might be higher outside the city center. I wrote, it might be as a result of fewer vehicles competing outside the city center, which means less competition. When there's less competition, the prices of goods and services will increase because consumers have few choices to make. Mm -hmm. So, few comp uh, lower com or less competition brings about higher increase in, uh, higher increase in prices. And when there's, large, when there's increasing competition, prices tend to fall. Do you understand? Yes. So, this will bring about higher prices as demand might be more than supply. So, with few competitors in the market, the demand for goods might increase than supply. As a result of that, price will increase. Is it clear? Yes. Any question about G? Go to question H. He said a lack of space in many busy cities cities means parking is an, is an increasing problem problem. Japan has developed the first automated parking system, APS. These are cars, these these are car parks where the cars are automatically stopped. The driver takes the car to the entrance, then technology takes over, placing each car on rack, one above the other. This allows many cars to be parked in a very small area. Not only do they offer a more practical use of space than traditional multi-story car parks, but they cost less to build. The drivers benefit from cheaper, cheaper parking fees and they save time. So go to the question. We said, with reference to the data we just read now, and our knowledge of economics, we should assess the extent to which changes in technology may reduce the shortage of car parking spaces in city centers. First. Technology makes things to become better and faster. Technology makes things to become what? Better and faster, that's efficiency. So without changes in technology, the demand for more parking space may be higher than supply. If we don't have changes in, with, without advancement in technology that has more brought about, that has been about APS, the demand for car parking space would increase, which is not really good because it's gonna take much of, much of the land. So the introduction of APS has increased the supply of space, shifting the supply curve to the right. So with APS, the supply for parking space has in with increased with the APS. So that's the point there. Advancement in technology reduces the gap between demand and supply. So now, there's no, the demand for the supply 
for APS might have bring about reduction in the demand. So the gap between demand and supply has reduced because with APS, it's a, with APS, which is an advanced technology that allows option or that allows us to have other options on how to pack and to reduce the amount of land we consume in terms of space, brings about reducing the gap between demand and supply for car, car parking space. So it can be graphically upsetted as this. So the supply for car. Uh, the supply for car will increase from S1 to S2 because the quantity demanded of car's parking space through APS has increased from Q1 to Q2. And as a result of that, the price for parks, car, car space, for parking space, would reduce from P1 to P2. And that was what they said. They said the price is cheaper because there is supply more than demand. I think it's clear. We go to question, question three. So they said, a product has an income elasticity of demand of 0 0.16, negative 0 0.16. If it's income elasticity, the degree of responsiveness between the quantity demanded of a product as a result of a change in the level of income. As soon as your YED gives a negative figure, it means it's an inferior good. As soon as your YED gives what? A negative figure. Negative YED is an inferior, so it is D. Clear? Yes. Question B. Which one of the following is a diseconomy of scale? Diseconomy of scale occurs when the average cost of production starts increasing due to expansion. That is diseconomies of scale. So the answer here is increasing bureaucracy. So the answer is B, an increase in bureaucracy. That means a lot of paperwork because of expansion. That would bring about diseconomies of scale. No, the draw. Question C. They said, Using the diagram below, draw the effect of a minimum wage being set above the equilibrium wage rate. Label the new quantity of labor demanded and new quantity of labor supply. What is equilibrium wage rate? The equilibrium wage rate is the agreement between demand for labor, the wage of agreement between the quantity demanded for labor and the quantity supply of labor. So where they met is what we call equilibrium wage rate. So they said, if the price is set above the equilibrium wage rate, that will bring about an increase in supply. Of labor. If the minimum wage, if price is set above the minimum wage rate, that means what you could pay, what people, workers are expecting or are willing to get increases. So the supply of workers would increase. People would want to do more work. They want to work more. Do you understand? And what happens to the quantity demanded for labor? The quantity demanded for labor would fall because firms or businesses would not be able to pay more. Do you get what I'm saying or not? Yes. Do you get it or not, please? Of course, yes. Wage rate means the amount you have to pay, the demand for labor and supply of labor, the wage that gives agreement between what workers are willing to get and what consumers or suppliers or employees, sorry, what workers are willing to pay to get and what employers are willing to pay them. That is what wage rate is. So if the minimum wage rate is, if the, labor, if the wage rate is set above the minimum, are you with me please? If the wage rate is set above the minimum wage rate, that, that becomes an incentive for employees to want to work more. So the supply of labor would increase more than the demand for, lab demand for labor. Because demand for labor means they are not, the amount of work, amount, the amount of work we are employers are willing to pay to their employees. The demand for labor is the number of employees, employees, employers are willing to employ at a given wage rate. That is demand for labor. And supply of labor is the total number of workers that are making themselves available for jobs. Please get the point I'm making here. There's demand for labor and supply of labor. Demand for, la demand for labor, for demand of labor, it simply means the numbers of workers firms are willing to employ at a given wage rate. Wage rate. That is demand for labor. And for supply of labor, it is the number of workers that are making themselves available for job at a given wage rate. So when the wage rate is set above the minimum wage rate, it means workers will be earning more, they will get more. As a result of that, the supply of labor would increase. So the supply of labor will shift to the right. At the same time, the demand for labor would reduce because firms would not be willing to pay more to workers because it represents an increase in their cost of wages. So the, the demand for labor would reduce, the supply of labor would increase because the minimum wage rate is set above, or the wage rate is set above the minimum wage rate. Do you get the point here? Yes. 
So the graph is like this. So the demand, the supply for labor would increase from QE to QS, and the demand for labor would reduce from QE to QD. Mm -hmm. Do you get it? Because price set above the minimum wage rate will bring about excess supply of labor. Is it clear? Is it clear, please? Is it clear, please? Question D. Firms in Canada, the world's second largest country, have been struggling to find the labor needed for specialist positions such as computer engineers and web designers. The Global Talent Stream is a government program that provides firms with a quick way to hire highly skilled foreign workers. High cost and long time commitments often stop Canadians from training. Although a processing fee is payable for each new employee, firms have welcomed the program. With reference to the data above and your knowledge of economics, analyze why Canadian firms may, be, may have been struggling to hire the labor they needed. So Canadian firms may have been struggling to hire the labor need, they needed based on the following reasons. One, there might be a few people with the skills needed in Canada. So they needed special talents, special skills for comp engineers, computer engineers and web designers. So these kind of people might not be available in Canada. As a result of that, they might be struggling to hire labor. They might be struggling to hire people that has these skills that is needed. That was the first point. Two, Canada is the second largest country, world's second largest country, right? So that means the geographical location may be the issue of, as Canada is a big country. As a result, it might be difficult for people to move into a specific region because Canada is so big. So it might be difficult for people to move from one region to another. And as those that have the skills, there might be those that have the skills in Canada, but where they are might be so far away from where the demand for labor of these skills are needed. So it might be difficult for them to move. Geographical location might be difficult. Are you getting it, please? The third point. The reward for computer engineers may be higher in, off in other countries, making Canada unattractive for employees. So the third point here is that, yeah, Canada needs computer engineers and web designers. But maybe in other countries, they pay more than Canada. Mm -hmm. So web designers and computer, computer engineers would prefer to go to other countries than coming to Canada. So that might make, that might make the supply of labor reduce. Do you get it? Any question about it? Yes. So go to question three. E. It said productivity is a measure of how efficiently goods and services are produced and is the single most important determinant of a country's per capita income. Canada's labor productivity growth has been lower has been lower than that of other leading economies for many decades, reducing its international competitiveness. Since 2011, however, Canada's labor productivity has greatly improved and it is now the third most productive of the 16 leading economies. So, here they say, with the reference to the data above and your knowledge of economics, assess the extent to which an increase in education and training is the best way to increase productivity. First, what is productivity? Productivity is output divided by input. Do you understand? Output divided by inputs. So that's what productivity is about. So with education and training, education and training would improve the skills and knowledge of people. So I wrote, education and training may be the best way to increase productivity due to the following reasons. One, it improves skills which might be used in technical areas, technical areas. With education and training, so there are some technical parts of production. So you need to be educated, you need to be trained. So with education and training, those technical areas that, are, that skills are needed, You'll be, able to, you'll be able to be functioning and responsible there. Mm -hmm. Two, education and training improve skills of workers, which may lead to higher productivity. So for productivity to increase, input, especially labor, must improve its skills. So that is the second point. The third point, training allows workers to feel motivated and valued. As a result, they may put more effort at workplace. When workers are being exposed to training, it means the, the, the business or the employers value them. That means they see them as part of uh, an integral part of the organization. And this might make employees, employees to be motivated and happy. As a result, they may do more, they may put more effort. And that will, that will increase productivity. However, the cost of training may be too high, which represents expenses for the firm. So yes, it is education and training, but it has its own problems too. To train workers, it is expensive and it represents a cost. Yeah, it represents a cost of produ for production. Two, it takes a long time for the benefit of education and training to influence 
productivity. So, yes, training and education is good. But as soon as you have been trained, it doesn't, make, it doesn't mean that you, everything will be okay at the beginning. So it takes time. So the benefits you are looking for, the benefits you are looking out for, out for, you might not get it immediately. It might take a long period of time. So that was the point about that. So go to question four. Are you there? Yes. Question four. We have the graph. So they said, figure six this figure shows the quantity of the goods supplied and demanded at different price levels. So there's a equilibrium price around 31, 32, 33, or 33.5. That's the equilibrium price. Where demand and supply meet, that's the equilibrium mm -hmm. price. But that is not the point they're making. They said, using the information in figure six, calculate the excess supply of goods in the market at a price of $50. Excess supply, occur, excess supply occurs when, there is, when the price is set above the equilibrium price. Above the equilibrium price brings about excess supply. So excess supply is between the 50 here, down here. So when you trace it down here, it is 50, and when you trace it down here, it is 20. So 50 minus 20 is 30. So excess supply is 30. Is it clear? Yes. Is it clear, please? 30. Is it clear? Yes, yes. Question 4B, are you there? I said, Competition and market authority warns online sellers about collusion. When we talk about collusion, it means firms are in the same industry come together to form a cartel. Cartel in the, in, in the in form of setting prices together, not wanting to compete with each other. That is what the cartel is. So I'm going to read. The Competition and Market Authority, CMA, is a UK government department that aims to increase competition. It has reminded online sellers of electrical equipment that collusion is illegal and can result in serious penalties. The case study is there anyway for students to read. With reference to the data above and your knowledge of economics, analyze why collusion may be a disadvantage for online consumers buying electrical equipment. Collusion is a situation where firms in the same industry form a cartel. This reduces competition because firms cooperate with each other. Firms, businesses, they come together, they cooperate with each other. So what will happen if this happens? One, this means they, they may fix prices and restrict competitiveness. Because they cooperate, so they set the price, which consumers will not be able to change. So that means they, they restrict competition. Two, it may lead to barriers to entry as the few firms that collide may make higher profits and dominate. If there's collision, it means the few firms in that industry or that market will have the upper hand over the smaller firms. And if they have upper hand over the smaller firms, the smaller firms might be forced to leave the industry. And for new firms that are trying to come in, they will find it difficult to penetrate or to come into the market because the market is not friendly. Is it clear? Yes. Then we'll go to the last question, question 4 C. We have a table, we have a chart here. He said, with reference to the, to the data above and your knowledge of economics, evaluate how firms might be influenced by competing in an oligopoly, such as supermarkets in the Netherlands. So when we talk about oligopoly, oligopoly is a market structure where there, there, are, where there are a few firms dominating the market. Few firms, large few firms are dominating, dominating the market. So for example, here we have Jumbo. We have Jumbo based on the case study. We have Jumbo, we have Super Uni, and Halbert. They are dominating. They have the largest market share in the market. So they have 83.5 in total. So they are dominating. So since there is lack of price war, based on oligopoly. Since there's lack of price work, branding and advertising costs might be higher, which may create barriers for new entrants. For oligopoly, they don't, there's no price war. It means we don't, we don't compete with each other using price to compete. So we can compete with our brand, we can compete through advertisement. So in spending on advertisement is difficult for smaller firms. So as a result of that, small firms will find it difficult to come into such market because the market is highly expensive. The cost of starting the market Especially oligopoly, the cost of going to an oligopoly is high, so it might create a barrier to entry. The third point: smaller firms may be able to compete. Well, wow. smaller firms may be able to come. Okay, I wrote. A few large firms may be able to export economies of scale, which may lead to lower average costs and higher profits. For the few large firms that operate in oligopoly, they can operate on a larger scale because they are large, they are big, so their model, their mode of operation could be large. As a result of that, they will be able to exploit economies of scale. And if they're able to exploit economies of scale, the average cost of production are likely to fall, mm -hmm. which means they, they will be making profits. 
Also, for smaller firms, for smaller firms like Aldi, Lady, they may be able to compete if they are able to create a niche. So the smaller firms in this industry, in this supermarket industry, they might also be able to compete if they can find a specific market in the mass market. However, the dominance might not last as market continues to change due to advancement in technology. So yeah, technology is technological advancement, which makes things to change. Smaller firms might be able to invest in technology. People might even buy online instead of going to supermarkets. So things might change. So that means the dominance in the market might not last for a long period of time. So that's the problem about oligopoly. And the last point, if the supermarkets in the oligopoly cannot keep up, they may lose dominance. If they cannot continue to compete, uh, if they cannot maintain their position in the market, like Albert, Super, Super Uni, and Jumbo, Jumbo, if they cannot maintain their position in the market, Lady, Aldi, and others might just take over the market from them. So that hence question four and paper one, May June 2019, economics.